We turn now to our next guest, who will break down yesterday's historic decision from the U.S. Supreme Court. It ruled for the first time that former presidents have broad immunity from prosecution that extends the delay in Donald Trump's trial in Washington on charges of election interference, and it all but rules out a trial before the November election. We'll get into all of that in a, in a moment with our guests. So let me introduce now to break down all of this, what ha what it means, what happened yesterday is Stetson University College of Law professor Chara torres Spellacy. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Chara. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm really glad you could join us and uh, we're gonna break down all the details, but let's start with the big picture. So what's important to know about yesterday's ruling? So I have been writing about uh, Trump's ongoing criminal uh, liability in my new book, Corporatocracy. And I think all of the fears that I laid out in that book sort of came to pass uh, with this presidential immunity decision from the Supreme Court. Uh, the court gives uh, a new and broad immunity to core presidential powers. Uh, they didn't go as far as Trump wanted. So Trump wanted the entire case thrown out. Uh, and they didn't do that. But uh, they helped him enormously. Number one, they helped him with the timing of all of this. Uh, Jack Smith uh, had originally asked to expedite this case. He knew that this would end up in front of the Supreme Court. And he, uh, you know, sort of pleaded with them, can you please give me an expedited hearing on this? And the court refused. They said, go back to the lower courts, litigate it there. And then if it comes to us, it comes to us. So he does that. He wins with Judge Chutkin. He wins in the D.C. Circuit, who both come to the, I think, perfectly logical conclusion that ex-presidents are not categorically immune. It goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, hears it on the last day of hearings for this Supreme Court term. Then they sit on the decision until the last day for decisions to be issued in the Supreme Court term. And we finally got that decision yesterday. Um, it is um, earth shattering in terms of the powers that it gives all presidents, including President Biden. I, I said a lot, so let me pause there. Yeah, I want to remind people that we're speaking with Stetson University College of Law professor Chara torres Spellacy on Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa, and we're talking about yesterday's historic decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, so one of the things that the, I guess the main thing it did is that it granted presidents absolute immunity for official acts as president. So let's specifically look at the Trump case here that it, that we're talking about. Um, what is former President Trump charged with and how could this impact that trial and also the timing of that trial? So he is charged with interfering with the 2020 election. Uh, there were many different um, octopus legs to that um, crime. Uh, so one of the things that he stands accused of doing is helping to orchestrate the fake electors attempt. So in many different states, um, there were dueling slates of electors, um, one that was legitimate and for uh, Joe Biden. And then there were these fake electors who pretended that they were real electors, which is in itself is a federal crime. And now we are finding is a crime in several of the states because there are ongoing criminal prosecutions in multiple states over the fake elector scheme. So that was one aspect of all of this. Um, he also uh, tried to gut the DOJ and have the DOJ seize voting machines. Uh, there was a strange moment in there where he had uh, tried to appoint Sidney Powell as uh, a <laughs> some sort of voting czar to investigate uh, the election. And this is all after courts had already rejected every plausible legal way of dealing with the results of the 2020 election. Like he had his day in court. He, he just utterly failed because he didn't win that election. 
Uh, and then there are the January 6th problems. So uh, on January 6th, he has this huge crowd that he has encouraged to come to DC through a series of tweets and other public statements. Uh, then he gives an incendiary speech to that crowd. Uh, some members of that crowd then break into the Capitol in a violent way that injures over 100 members of law enforcement. And then he sort of does nothing for hours uh, to stop uh, the violence of this crowd or their object. And one of their objects seemed to have been, if we're going to take their word for it, they were trying to hang Mike Pence. And the reason that they were trying to hang Mike Pence is there had been enormous pressure put on Pence by Trump and some of his lawyers to uh, interfere with the lawful and constitutionally mandated count of electoral college votes on January 6th. And I, I have to give credit where credit is due, Mike Pence didn't do that. Uh, and so one of the sort of charges here is, you know, the plot to essentially pressure the vice president into um, breaking the law and breaking the constitution. Uh, so, what the court does here is it sets up three new categories. So with core presidential powers, that gets absolute immunity. And I think what the court means by this is those powers that are specifically enumerated in Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution. You know, that the president is the commander in chief, that he has the pardon power, uh, that he gets to appoint ambassadors and judges. Those are all explicit powers that the Constitution gives to every president. Uh, then there are implied powers that are more, um, uh, the court talks about a sort of a twilight zone. This comes from uh, an older case. Uh, called Youngstown Steel, where uh, in that case, it was President Truman. He seizes the uh, steel mills uh, in the middle of the Korean War. He thinks he has a good reason for doing this, where um, we have a need for steel in order to arm our troops. But the Supreme Court uh, brushed back uh, Truman in that decision, and they talked about where presidential power is at its sort of highest ebb and lowest ebb. And, and so the court reincorporates that, um, <laughs> the Truman model somewhat into this opinion and decides that those types of peripheral presidential powers are going to get presumptions of immunity, but those uh, presumptions could be rebutted in a particular case. And the court in particular says that the what happened between Trump and Vice President Pence might be in that sort of twilight zone where you could um, sort of pierce the immunity. And then finally, the court has this third new category which is for unofficial acts. And unofficial acts get zero immunity from prosecution. Uh, and that may be outcome determinative for uh, President Trump's future prosecution. Even Trump's own attorney at the Supreme Court said that uh, many of the things that he is charged with, he did in his private capacity. And I hope that courts hold those lawyers to those representations at the Supreme Court because they already admitted that a lot of what happened uh, was in his private capacity and that does not get immunity. Our guest is Setson University College of Law Professor Chara torres Spellacy, and we're talking about yesterday's U.S. Supreme Court ruling granting presidents absolute immunity for official acts. I'm Sean Canan. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. So the whether or not these acts are official acts and whether or not the president has immunity or the former president, that all has to now be determined by a lower court. So how is all that going to work? And how does that... Um, how does the evidence that's presented 
how is that impacted by whether these are official or unofficial acts? Okay, so the court gives uh, Judge Chutkin a huge homework assignment here. Um, they don't articulate every single time when something is going to be official or not official. Uh, that is going to be left to uh, trial courts uh, in future cases, including this one. And so she's going to have to entertain arguments. And I think the arguments are going to be starkly different from each side. So Jack Smith, the special prosecutor, is going to argue that everything that he's charged is a private act. And Trump's attorneys are going to counter that none of it is a private act, that it was all under his official capacity as president. And it'll be up to the trial judge to figure that out. I mean, on the upside, uh, the court clarifies that campaigning for a president is an unofficial act. That's a private act. And much of the behavior around the 2020 election and trying to overthrow it was really Trump acting as a candidate, not as a president. And one of the reasons we know that is the running of uh, presidential elections. So administering a presidential election is given constitutionally to the states and to Congress, and then for like five seconds to the vice president. So it's the states that run presidential elections. Then when that is done, uh, it is Congress that counts uh, those electoral college votes. And the vice president on January 6th is the one who essentially opens the envelopes and helps with the count in Congress in his capacity as the president of the Senate. But the president, you might notice in that list, is nowhere to be found. The president is merely a candidate, and that is in his private capacity. So I sort of fully expect that the way that this will eventually play out is that Judge Chutkin will decide that uh, this was all campaigning, and as such, it is uh, an, not an official act and is not immunized. So while I think Trump has already done a little victory lap about this decision, it may actually not save him. What about can these courts, the lower court, can it consider Trump's motives when when it's uh, weighing these the evidence here? So here is where uh, there was a split even among the conservative justices. So most of this opinion is, 6-3, as in all of the conservatives vote uh, to expand immunity and all of the liberal justices um, are to have their uh, dissents angrily saying that you have changed the nature of the presidency and you've gone too far. But where there is um, some difference of opinion is on this question of evidence. So Judge Barrett joins with the liberal justices on this question of evidence. Um, so the majority holds that you cannot bring in evidence from a president's uh, core official acts. Uh, those are all official. So they are uh, completely and absolutely immune. And you cannot even bring in evidence from those official acts that might illuminate what they are doing with their private acts. And uh, for Justice Barrett, this was a bridge too far. Um, and I, I completely agree with her and the justices in dissent that uh, it is uh, going to be very, very strange to try to explain to a jury what uh, a particular president is accused of even doing if you have to redact out some of what he does in his official capacity. Because in some instances, it's going to be incredibly intertwined. Uh, and it may make the narrative seem to make no sense. But uh, here, you're not allowed to take in uh, questions of motive if in order to do so, you have to expose an investigation into 
core presidential duties. I mean, this is all like a mouthful and this is going to be a lawyer's delight. Like this is going to cause lots and lots of filings um, in the Trump cases. And I'd imagine if we have a future president who is really close or beyond the criminal line, they're going to, you know, hug this opinion and like put it under their pillow so they can sleep better at night. It is really, really bad. So we've talked about this this decision kind of closing the door to judicial review of official conduct of the president. But what about can Congress regulate the president's actions here? No, this one of the ways that this uh, decision was really extreme is it didn't just close courthouse doors to questions around the criminality of presidents when they are exercising their core powers. It also made clear that Congress can't um, legislate in this area either. I mean, in some ways, this is... Um, it's similar to how Congress has always sort of stayed away from certain presidential powers. So, for example, um, the pardon power has always been thought of as nearly plenary. But uh, in the last couple of years, we've had to have these weird discussions about the possibility of a, cor a corrupt pardon or a self-pardon. Now, no president has been so bold as to pardon themselves. Um, you know, the biggest pardon in U.S. history was President Ford pardoning Richard Nixon after Watergate. But that was, you know, one president um, pardoning the ex-president. Uh, we've never had anyone try to do a self-pardon. And uh, the other thing that fortunately I think we've never really seen is someone just outright paying for a pardon, like just bribing uh, a president for a pardon. And I think what this decision opens the door to are both of those horrifying possibilities, because it basically says that with core presidential duties, and pardoning power is a core presidential duty, you can find it right in the Constitution, that those uh, types of actions by the president cannot be reviewed. They can't be reviewed by the court and you can't have a congressional law that says, you know, no corrupt pardons. So this is just a, the, the magnitude of this change, I think is going to take us years to fully appreciate. Let's talk a little bit about what Justice Sotomayor wrote in her dissent. One of the things she said is the president is now a king above the law. Is that going to, is, is she exaggerating? So they didn't quite go as far as Trump wanted. Um, so, and, but Trump had, had sort of tried this in several different cases. So when he was a sitting president and uh, Cy Vance in the Southern, in, in, in New York, um, he had the job before Alvin Bragg. Um, so the DA for Manhattan was already sort of sniffing around Trump's various um, potential crimes. And uh, he, Cy Vance, ran into um, this Trump argument that you, you like, nan and boo boo, you can't catch me, I'm the president. And that was litigated at the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court actually said in the Vance case that uh, the law is entitled to all men's evidence. And they said, go ahead, investigate even a sitting president. If you have you know, probable cause to think that there is a crime here, go ahead. Uh, now, what Cy Vance was looking at was uh, actions by Trump and the Trump Organization before Trump was president. And that may be a key difference. Uh, and in order to like make these two decisions, the one we got yesterday in Vance make sense, I think that's one way you could reconcile them. Uh, so Trump made the position in that case that he was completely immune and the Supreme Court said, no, you're not completely immune uh, from criminal subpoenas. 
And uh, in another case called Mazar's, that was a fight between Trump and Congress, where Congress was trying to get some information from Trump, and Trump did his old, like, na 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 boo boo I'm the president, you can't get me. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, no, that's not right either. But they put new hoops that Congress had to jump through before they could get information from a sitting president. And uh, with Trump versus the United States, uh, they've immunized some actions by the president if they are sort of explicitly in the Constitution, but with the unofficial acts, they are not immunized. So uh, I think this is just going to lead to like so much litigation, uh, I think, in the future. And it's going to slow down um, the January 6th criminal trial for Trump. And if all he was trying to est establish with all of this was delay, then he succeeded in that front, uh, because it seems very unlikely that we will get a criminal trial in this uh, case before the 2024 election. Our guest is Stetson University College of Law, Professor Chara torres Spellacy, and we're talking about yesterday's historic U.S. Supreme Court ruling that grants presidents absolute immunity for official acts. I'm Sean Canan. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And one of the other things that Justice Sotomayor wrote in her defense is she said that the Supreme Court had created a law-free zone around the president and that she warned of the dangers of criminal presidents from here on. Uh, mm -hmm. Any thoughts about the possibility of those things? Yeah, I'm just in the middle of uh, writing a piece about <laughs> what it would look like if we take this new authority that's been given um, by Trump versus the United States, yesterday's decision from the Supreme Court, and we applied it to the Nixon facts. So because I'm a campaign finance uh, professor, I have spent a lot of quality time looking at Watergate uh, because modern federal campaign finance law was inspired by the crimes in Watergate. So uh, one of the crimes that uh, happened during Watergate was uh, Nixon is trying to raise money for his reelection in 1972. And he breaks all sorts of laws doing this. And the two main ways that he breaks the law is he asks for money from corporations who are barred from giving to federal candidates under a law called the Tillman Act, which is from 1907. And then the other huge way that he broke the law in raising money for the Nixon reelection campaign otherwise known as the Committee to Reelect the President, which has the awesome acronym CREEP. So the other way he made money for CREEP was by selling ambassadorships. And so one of the things that Nixon's lawyer, Herb Kalmbach, is convicted for in the Watergate scandal is for selling ambassadorships. Now, selling an ambassadorship doesn't work unless you have a president who's also in on the deal who will actually appoint the donor to be an ambassador, which is exactly what he did. But under this opinion, appointing ambassadors is a core presidential power. It's right there in the Constitution. And the court just immunized that behavior. So you could not get Nixon for being in on the scam to sell ambassadorships under this opinion. And that's pretty horrifying. Um, and even Amy Coney Barrett in her concurrence said, how are we ever going to be able to prosecute bribery against the sitting president if you can't bring in their official acts? If you know the bribery statute basically says that it's giving money for a official act. Well, if you can't bring in the official act uh, evidence, does this just mean that uh, the whoever is in the presidency is you know now free to take bribes? I mean, the whole thing is pretty horrifying. And before we move on to Justice Katanji Brown Jackson's dissent, I want to uh, read one last thing from Sotomayor that may have stuck out even the most, and it said that. Um, uh, or what if the president orders the Navy SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival and she answers immune, organizes a military coup to hold on to power, 
immune, takes a bribe in exchange for pardon, which we've kind of already talked about. Immune, immune, immune is what uh, Justice Sotomayor is saying. So, so um, obviously, I'm not hoping that anything like this happens, but the the sitting president could assass order the assassination as an official act of his political rival. And uh, at least according to yesterday's decision by the Supreme Court, that's not reviewable at all. Yeah, I mean, this would be the president using his commander in chief power. Um, I mean, the the breadth of this is just astonishingly bad. Uh, and what I think this now leaves us with as the last two safeguards are the impeachment power. But as we've seen in recent years, um, you know, Clinton was impeached, Trump was impeached twice, neither of them were removed from office. So I think the potency of that power is always hinged on, do you have one third of the Senate that sticks with you? And if you do, then you get to remain in power no matter how many horrible things you have done while you're president, which is not great. And so ultimately this is in the hands of voters. Um, if voters don't want you know, a, a convicted felon in the White House, they shouldn't vote for a convicted felon. And Katanji Brown Jackson, Justice Jackson, also dissented and said similar things to what Sotomayor was saying, that this the Supreme Court is incentivizing crimes by president, that the Supreme Court has usurped Congress's role, and that this there this could excuse murders or coups. So, you know, we're just getting kind of the um, I'm trying to maybe summarize some of what she said, because some of it is what Sotomayor was saying as well. But maybe I should ask you then this SCOTUS ruling, could it impact the other Trump cases as well, since um, could they be considered to be official acts and and maybe even the, the, the um, conviction that he's already had? Could some of that get wiped out? So let's take let's take them one trial at a time. Uh, so we just had a conviction in the New York case for falsifying business records, which is a violation of New York state law. Um, there could be a few of the counts. So he was found guilty unanimously on all 34 counts um, by that ju jury in New York. Uh, a few of those counts could be uh, bounced under this uh, decision because, uh, if you'll remember, some of the payments that Trump made to Michael Cohen, which is sort of the source of all of this, uh, were made while he was a sitting president. And so there's at least a, a plausible argument that a few of these counts are now immunized under this ridiculous new decision. So I doubt that he would be able to throw out the every you know all thirty four counts, but a few might go away, uh, and we'll see. I mean, Trump has already said that he plans to appeal the entire conviction, so we'll see what the lower courts in New York feel like doing. Um, so in Georgia, that uh, is going to have very similar fact patterns as the one in um, DC. So these are charges that arise out of the attempt to overthrow the 2020 election. And, um, but on the other hand, I think both the January 6th um, case in DC, as well as the January 6th case out of uh, Georgia, this is really Trump as a campaigner. It's not Trump as president. Um, it, it might get a little weird with the call that Trump made to Georgia officials, basically demanding that they manufacture new votes for him and just enough votes for him to win the state of Georgia. I don't think that that should be deemed an official act because it seems pretty clear that that is him acting in his capacity as a candidate, trying to like, you know, suck up votes that don't exist, like a Hoover vacuum cleaner. Um, but that I think is going to be something that is litigated and is going to take time. And then finally, there's the Mar-a-Lago case. So with the Mar-a-Lago case, um, 
you have the accusation that Trump, as he's leaving the White House, um, absconds with sensitive classified documents. And then the crime is that he won't give them back. Like Nara, who has um, authority over these documents, you know, asks and asks and asks, and he gives back some, but not all of them. It, the FBI eventually has to uh, go in and search Mar-a-Lago to find the remaining um, documents. And what they find are things with classified markings. And as an ex-president, he had no right to those. Those belong to uh, the archive. And so with that case, there may be some strange thing that drops out because he takes them while he is president. And while he is president, he's allowed to have these documents. But since the gravamen of that case is that he retained them when he was an ex-president, I don't think that changes because of the Trump versus U.S. case. I want to thank you very much for coming on Tuesday Cafe today, Chara. Thank you so much. Chara torres LLC is professor of law at Stetson University College of Law in Gulfport. This has been Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. Tomorrow is Midpoint. And coming up next is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom. They're going to talk about the importance and resiliency of independent locally owned bookstores with local owners and authors. This is WMNF Tampa.